Yeah, I'm really excited to see so many people here, you know. Uh, some people I recognize your faces, some I don't, but I'll bet you I remember your coronary angiogram. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyways, um, I was asked to do this doc talk, and, um, you know, I thought, well, what would really kind of interest everybody? And um, so I thought I would just kind of recapitulate. Um, I've been doing this for 45 years now. But I wanted to take you through the, 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 one of the most, in my opinion, spectacular stories in medicine as to how we have come from uh, watching a patient in a coronary care unit literally die of a heart attack and heart muscle damage, and there was nothing we could do to literally resurrecting people from the dead who are having uh, myocardial infarctions with heart-lung machines, with stents, with support devices to allow us to open up the plumbing and get better blood flow to the heart. It, it, because it's a fascinating story and it is um, an incredible uh, melding of uh, engineering uh, and medicine that's just nothing been like it before. So then I ended up in uh, cardiovascular disease. And the reason I did is because it's pumps, valves, wires, and pipes to the engineer. Okay, it was the only thing that made sense to me about this incredible machine. So uh, that's, that's how it all evolved. So enough of that background and stuff, but um, so uh, let's get into the history of this. So when this whole thing started about um, doing uh, uh, balloon procedures and, and um, stents and all this stuff. It started with a guy by the name of Charles Donner. This is on, was on the cover of Life magazine in 1964. The guy looks like a madman, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it, and um, it, this is a story that has been told to me by my mentors who were also uh, colleagues of um, Dr. Charles Donner. But he did the, what is considered to be the first angioplasty in a human that was done in the world, for that matter. Um, and it was a lady by the name of Bessie Shaw. She, Bessie was about 84 years old, and she was just about ready to lose her leg um, because she didn't have any circulation to it. What he did is he designed these uh, 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 serial tapered dilators that were bigger and bigger, and he slid them over a guide wire through the blockage in the artery in the thigh and her leg and progressively opened it up such to the point that she, it saved her leg. And so, you know, it didn't get published in a medical journal. It got published in Look magazine, you know. So. In 1974, a guy by the name of Andreas Grunzig, uh, who was in uh, Germany and Switzerland, he came up with this idea of mounting a balloon on a catheter and you could slide it over a wire and position it on a blockage and then inflate the balloon and break up the blockage so that it would improve blood flow. The, the, the most important contribution he made was that he developed, and believe it or not, he made these in his kitchen, okay? Miniaturized balloons that he thought would be able to um, put in human coronary arteries. Now, human coronary arteries, okay, are only about two millimeters in diameter, outer diameter. They're little, little blood vessels, but boy, they can cause a hell of a lot of trouble, okay? They did that on 12 patients, and they did it actually here in the United States in San Francisco. Uh, it was Dr. Grunzig and the, uh, Dr. Myler, who was one of my mentors years ago, and a, and a cardiothoracic surgeon by the name of Elias Hanna. And so they did those 12 cases, and then after they did the um, uh, bypass surgery, and they did that little balloon thing kind of experiment, which you could do those kind of things back in 1976, but um, uh, they uh, then hooked the bypass in, and before that, those patients went home, they did another heart catheterization on it, and lo and behold, in every one of those patients that they had done that, here's a bypass going to the artery in the front of the heart, Where's the blockage? They couldn't see the blockage. There was no blockage there. It's like, whoo, this might work. And um, so they petitioned the FDA to start doing it in the cardiac cath lab. The FDA said, you're out of your mind. You ain't doing it. 
And um, so Dr. Grunzig ended up and did the, um, oh, now it's working, Al. Okay. <laughs> he did the first in the cath lab PTCA, percutaneous transluminal, that means you go through the channel in the artery, coronary angioplasty. Okay, and September 16th, 1977. There was about 25 people in the cath lab watching him, and of those 25, about 23 of them were hoping he'd fail because they were cardiothoracic surgeons. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, interestingly, so, and they were the king of the hill, you know, I mean, that was uh, back then. Um, so anyways, I, um, if you look in the upper left panel, okay, where that white circle is and everything, you can see where the, the, where the, the angiogram, where the artery narrows down, okay? So many of you already know what this is, and many of you probably have had one of these. It's called the Widowmaker lesion, okay? It's in the main artery in the front of the heart. That's a Widowmaker lesion, okay? And then after he did the balloon procedure, you can see the difference in, in how it's opened up as compared to before he put the balloon in there. Uh, it was considered a rousing success, and 20 years later, as part of the 20th anniversary of coronary angioplasty, this patient uh, allowed um, his doctors to repeat an angiogram, and this is the angiogram 20 years later. So Dr. Myler um, took this to the FDA and said, hey, look, we're going to start doing this. You, 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 there's, this, is, this is for real, okay? And they, so the FDA said, yeah, you can do it, and we'll, we'll see how things go, but... You know, you're on double secret probation here for now. So these are the two guys, and they were my mentors, okay, back in um, uh, 84 and 85. These are the guys that taught me out in San Francisco, Simon Sturzer and Richard Myler. And on my, March 1st, 1978, they both did the first coronary angioplasty in the United States, okay? Dr. Sturzer claims that he did the first one because he did his at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> and Dr. Myler was on the West Coast. He did his at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. And Sturzer finished before Myler did. So <laughs> in 1986, and uh, there are two what I would call sentinel moments in my career that I said, holy hell, this is going to be big. Okay, and this was one of them, okay. A gentleman, believe it or not, he was from Mount Vernon, okay, and he had had bypass, and this is 1986, he had had bypass surgery twice at the Cleveland Clinic, okay, and the, the surgeons up at Cleveland Clinic said, uh, we can't do a third open heart surgery in this guy, that's almost impossible, and back then it was impossible. And so some of my uh, cardiology colleagues that I trained with back in San Francisco and everything, and they said, well, we, we ought to send him down to Barry George. You know, maybe he can do something, you know. And so, okay. So, and, and like I say, he was from Mount Vernon. So um, it, he, he came to me, and I, you know, I said, okay, yeah, you got a problem here. And that one artery that's plugged up, it's a 95% blockage. And, you know, they're, they're not going to do bypass on you. And it, it's a big artery. Okay, this thing totally shuts off. It's not going to be a pretty picture. And I said, so there's risk. I said, you know, I, I think I 90% chance I can get you through it. I said, about a 10% chance I won't. And I said, we cannot do bypass surgery. That is not an option. Okay, this is fourth and goal. And he said, okay, I want to go with it. I said, okay. So we went ahead with it. And so I put the balloon down there. We got the balloon right across the blockage and everything. Inflated the balloon, deflated the balloon. And all of a sudden, he started having real bad chest pain. And his EKG started looking like a heart attack. His heart rate dropped down to about 20 or 30. And I took a picture with dye and everything, and the vessel was totally closed. It was 90 to 95% block. Now it was 100% block. Uh, ironically, his son was a doctor and was in the room watching Okay, and um, you know, and I'd look back at him and I said, "This ain't good. This ain't good." And uh, he goes, "Oh." And the next, in about oh, about a minute later, I heard this thunk, like somebody dropped a pumpkin on the floor. Okay, and it was him. He passed out. His the son passed out in the cat lap. <laughs> and at the same time that he passed out, 
then the patient on the table got what's called ventricular tachycardia, where your heart rate goes about 180 or so and everything. And, and, they, and, and so they're all running towards the doctor on the floor. And I said, no, 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 no. He's going to be all right. Don't worry about him. You know, I said, you shock this guy right now. <laughs> so anyways, we did that. And um, so if you look at the pictures, okay, here's what happened. The artery is 100% blocked. Okay, that's the right corner, it's 100%. You see how that black line comes down there and then it just stops? Okay. But by the grace of God, okay, I had just uh, come back from um, uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham where the doctor who in, uh, and uh, the cardiologist who had invented the first coronary stent, we were just starting a clinical trial on the, the coronary stents in humans and we had FDA approval and everything. And so when this happened and everything and things are looking real ugly and everything, I said, well, you know, if there ain't a time that we should try this stent, now's the time. So we, we uh, put the stent in on this total blockage, okay? And if, if you see that little loop down there in the lower right-hand corner, that's a pacemaker in there, a temporary pacemaker, because his heart just quit beating. It just stopped, okay? And then we put the stent in, and lo and behold, there's what it looked at. And I... And, you know, I looked at my assistant. I said, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. This is like a man landing on the moon. I said, man, this is going to be big. I know we're going to have to iron a few things out. This is huge. And prior to the stent era, when you did coronary balloon angioplasty, you had a cardiothoracic surgeon on standby, and he was just sitting there waiting for you to screw up. So you could take him to open, so he could take him to open heart surgery, and he could be the knight in shining armor coming there and everything. So when we did this and everything, my fortunately I had a fairly good relationship with most of the cardiothoracic surgeons, despite all this stuff that's going on. And I, had, I called him in the room. I said, "Hey, look at that." I said, "What do you think?" But well, he said, "He said, yeah, they told me to come over here in a hurry because you may have to take this guy to surgery." I said, "You ain't gonna take this guy to surgery." I said, "He's had it twice." All right, and this is the third time. And he said, well, how'd you get that artery to look like that? And he, I said, I put a stent in. He said, what's a stent? And I said, it's the beginning and the end for you. That's what it is. <laughs> so we dropped the mortality tenfold, okay, by using stents. And that was the clincher for the FDA. They said, you know, we, we can't in good conscience not approve this, this thing. Well, so... Here we are, we think we're really hot shots, man. We've just revolutionized things. A fundamental principle I learned with helping in the development of the stents and everything is for every problem you solve, you create two or three new ones. You just don't know what they are until you put it to the test. And that's exactly what happened with stents, okay? When you put a little thin piece of metal in an artery, the, in some patients, the, the reaction to that metal, they would form excess of scar and they would narrow the artery right back down. So be, between developing different types of biopolymers and different types of drugs and different types of matrix of the stent, this is all engineering folks, okay, um, we were able now to have stents that are only about 29 thousandths of an inch in diameter in thickness, I'm sorry, in thickness, and um, uh, they're a cobalt chromium alloy, which we figured out was better than P450 surgical stainless steel and better than uh, uh, nickel titanium alloys and all that sort of stuff. That it, it um, uh, works to the tune now that there's only about a uh, two in 100 percent, or two in 100 chance, two percent, okay, that where we place the stent now, the medicated stent, that blockage will ever come back again in your lifetime. Uh, the, uh, a carotid endarterectomy versus uh, carotid stenting was hotly debated. It was highly political, as well as there was a lot of science behind it. But the moral of the story is in 2024, okay, uh, there are certain patients that are better off to have carotid endarterectomy than carotid stenting, and there are more patients that are better off to have carotid stenting than to have carotid endarterectomy in 2024. But with all the research we've done and everything, it's basically become six one, half dozen the other. And the, the, the real proof of purchase is CMS approved carotid stenting for Medicare patients. 
and you know it, it takes them almost a lifetime to approve some of these newer technologies. So, but anyways, uh, now the cool thing about this too is is that we developed this uh, micro technology. It's like it's like a miniaturized upside down coffee filter, and we park that up in the carotid artery, and then we do our deal with we balloon it, and then we put the stent in. And then after we're done, okay, if any of the particles broke loose, and it only takes a, something the great size of a grain of sand, if it goes into the wrong blood vessel up in your brain, you know, you're babbling and you paralyzed and it's, it's horrible. So what this does is it catches it, okay, so it doesn't go up to the brain. And then when we're done doing what we're doing, then we just slide a catheter here and we just pull this thing down in like closing an umbrella. Um, what you see here is some uh, pretty impressive varicose veins, okay? Now, we're in the business of opening arteries most of the time and veins, okay? Sometimes we want to close the vein, particularly the veins. And so veins, unfortunately, are kind of like uh, the Columbus metropolitan area. You know, you got I-71 going north and south. You got 70 going east and west, and then you got 270 going around it. So there's all sorts of routes you can take. Veins are predominantly like that in your body. If you shut off one vein, usually it'll then it'll, it'll go around 270 or something like that, you know. And um, so, but what happens sometimes is when these valves start going bad in those, you get these varicose veins, okay? Because the the every time you walk, okay, the muscle contracts, it milks the blood in your veins back to your back to your heart, okay? Because veins are very thin walled. It, it literally squeezes them shut when the muscle contracts. The little valves, one-way valves, open, and it just kind of keeps milking it up against the effects of gravity down there. Well, as you get older, them valves tend to get leaky. Okay, and when they get leaky, the blood goes whoop, 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 and then sooner or later, then what happens is the valves get too leaky, you get these kind of varicose veins. So we have the technology and the capability where we can go in there and figure out which one of these ones is causing the problem and everything, and we, we just burn it okay, with what's called a radio frequency ablation. And it's a catheter that'll heat that vein up to about 270 degrees Fahrenheit, and it literally welds it shut, okay? And then, so the, the blood's gotta find a different route to go, and you, you uh, ablate the veins that you need to to reroute it so it goes, you know, where there's no road construction, and you got good valves, so to speak. Um, and the varicose veins go away or become much less prominent like what you see here. And you see a before and after on, on this particular patient's legs. So what does the future hold? I have no idea to be perfectly honest, okay? Where we are now compared to when I started my career, some of this stuff I never even dreamed of, okay? Never dreamed of it and never dreamed that I would be part of it. Here's the thing, okay? And I tell patients this all the time. I said, you know, I'd like to tell you I cured you. I didn't cure you, okay? If, any, if anybody can cure yourself, it's you, okay? You can come closer to the cure than me. I'm just a SWAT team, okay? I come in and put out the fire, and the rest is up to you. Okay, so what is the rest, okay? We have such things as statin drugs that lower your cholesterol, reduce the inflammation in the arteries. What we understand in 2024, this is a chronic, low-grade inflammatory process that weakens the walls of the arteries and causes deposits of uh, microlipid particles. And depending on what vital organ you're talking about, if it restricts blood flow to it, then it's gonna create problems. Okay, most particularly the heart and the brain. Um, so, but it, it can the liver, the GI tract, the kidneys, you know, legs, you know, it just depends. Atherosclerosis. That's what it is, okay? When we find a cure for cancer, trailing right with it, close to it, will be a cure for atherosclerosis. I firmly believe that it is a, an, an immunologic autoimmune process where your body thinks that when it creates this inflammatory process, it thinks that that part of your body is not your body. It's somebody else's, okay, and, it's, and it needs to attack it and kill it, okay? That's why you get this inflammatory process. So we gotta figure out what it is that goes wrong in the immunologic system that, that we all have 
that differentiates what is your self and what's not yourself, okay? Every day, you're making cells in your body that are just a little iffy, okay? Just a little iffy. And your immune system says, <laughs> you know, get the hell out of here, okay? And it kills it. It kills the cell, okay? Every once in a while and everything, what happens, and maybe it's because, I don't know, they had some kind of viral infection or something, the immune system gets a little confused and says, ah, all right, you pass. Hey, we made it through the gate, boys. Let's go to town, okay? And they start making more cells and more cells. Next thing you know, you got cancer. Cancer cells don't kill people. What it kills, why people die from cancer is because it infiltrates a vital organ, okay, and gets to the point where it causes that vital organ to malfunction, okay? Now, uh, so you say, okay, well, you cut it out. Well, that was the initial thought, okay? You cut the cancer out, all right, and then everything's going to be fine, okay? Yeah, well, it's coming back. Why? Okay, because you haven't, you haven't figured out what's, what's causing the problem with self versus non-self and that sort of thing. So the same thing goes for atherosclerosis. So I firmly believe that. I was told when I started medical school, by the time I was ready to finish my career, there would be a cure for cancer. Yeah, I'm getting pretty close. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with all that, I'm pretty much done. I want to thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and the third thank you is for my beloved wife, Brenda, over here. Brenda. Okay. She has stuck with me 47 years through all this BS, okay? <laughs> so, and um, she stuck with me when I, I went to California to do this coronary angioplasty fellowship. When 80% of the cardiology community